right, we're at time to begin. We're going to pick up in Colossians chapter 2. Go on into 3. <coughs> Lord willing, then next Sunday morning finish up the book of Colossians. pick up in Colossians chapter 2, around verse 11 here in just a moment. Uh, but before we begin, we'd like to be led in a word of prayer. Charles, can you lead us in that prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now as we enter into this study of your word that we made through reading and listening to your word, Father, grow more and more in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask forgiveness for our sins that we have committed and ask you to help us to overcome sin as we sojourn here in our temporary home. Pray, Lord, for the ones that uh, teach your word, that they will bring it forth in a way that all can understand and be able to apply to their lives, that they may grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Savior. Father, we pray for those who have never obeyed the gospel, that they will before their life is taken from them. And we ask you, Father, to be with those who are sick and cannot be here today, the shut-ins, and those, Father, that refuse to uh, listen to your word or want to be here to hear your word. We pray that you'll touch their hearts and uh, they'll turn around and away from their evil and wrong ways and turn to you, Father, to live a life that you would be proud of them too. Father, we pray you'll be with us as we uh, study. God, Father, in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Alright, Colossians chapter 2. Let's pick up in verse 11. And again, let's do this longer reading. One big section here, 11 through 23. And we're actually going to start in verse 15 as far as digging down into the chapter. Um, verse 15, verse 16 and following there. So, uh, Colossians 2, 11 down through 23. Who will grab that for us? John. In Him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them into open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of, a, of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Okay. So, in this entire section, what he's going through is salvation is in Christ, in His gospel, and not another system. And he 
hits a couple of these things as he goes through here. Um, they were being troubled at Colossae by these false teachers that were coming in. False teachers would include Judaizing teachers as he talks about the circumcision. But he also talks about this idea of, in John's translation, asceticism. These things that came out of the world, out of the Gentile world, as to how they could make themselves pure and holy before God. So he's laying all of this out and directing our minds to the fact that salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone and what Christ has revealed. So question number seven, getting down to verse 16, when he says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moons or Sabbaths, things like that. I had asked in question seven, is Paul saying we should observe new moons and Sabbaths and not allow others to judge us for doing that? Why or why not? Anybody? Okay, so what is he telling us? Is he addressing these Christians at Colossae and saying, hey, you... You go ahead and observe the new moons. You go ahead and observe the Sabbaths. You go ahead and keep the feast days. And don't let anybody tell you that you're wrong for doing that. Is that what he's saying to them? Or is he saying, don't let these guys who tell you to keep the new moons, keep the Sabbaths, keep the feast days, don't let them judge you. Don't worry about what they think about it. Which way do you think he's going on that question, Ron? I think he's going on the latter. Because you know what he's describing are the things that were contained in the old law, and the recognition of days, the priesthood, uh, food restrictions, and he is saying that you know we are dead to the old law, as we know in various other passages, and those things, as we, in the context of the scriptures, are also described as a yoke of bondage, because they could not keep them perfectly. Exactly. In the context, he's, he's explaining here how all these things have been done away with. They, they, there were these handwritings, these ordinances that were against us. And the Judaizing teachers are coming in and saying, hey, you have to do this. If you're really going to be right with God, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the Sabbath, you have to keep new moons, you have to keep all those feasts. You have to do all of that to be right with God because it's in the law of God, Right? That, that was their leverage. Well, this is the law of Moses. This was revealed by God. This is what God's people have done for millennia. So you, you, you need to keep that and you need to do that. And he's saying, look, even though they come to you with this argument that it's of the law and that law was revealed by God, you don't need to listen to that. You don't need to feel guilty that you're not keeping the Sabbath. You're not keeping the new moons. You're not observing those feast days. Uh, so don't let them judge you. It's like this. There are people today in modern times in the denominational world that they do things as a religious body that they think we should be doing too. And they may point to, look how many people come. Look how many people show up. Look at the impact we're having in the lives that we are changing. And they say, we should do that too, but it's not authorized in Scripture. They have all these programs. You know, maybe their church has a homeless shelter program. Or maybe they have a, um, you know, a daycare for mothers. Or maybe they have these other services, uh, job services. Or they have recreational facilities. Look at all the young people we get off the street and, you know, they're doing all these pure things. I don't feel a bit guilty about that. And that's essentially what he's saying here. Don't let them judge you in something that is not authorized in the Word of God. Don't let them do that. Even though it may be from the old law. So what does he say about these things, verse 17? What are they compared to Christ? Yeah, a shadow. Exactly right. They're a shadow. What's a shadow? It's a representative image of something that is yet to come. So it, it's 
as we see a shadow is a form, but it's not the exact representation. Okay. In fact, could we go so far to say it is a shallow form? It's almost, I mean, if you go outside like today, Sonny, um, let's, I mean, I can see out those doors right now, and I can see the shadow of the trees on the grass across the street. That shadow is telling me there's something there, but all it is is just a darker spot on the ground. That is radically different than looking at the tree and the branches and the leaves and the colors that are in the leaves and how those leaves may shake in the wind and how the light hits them, all those kinds of things. It's completely different, right? It's, it's related, it's a shadow, but the full substance is not that shadow. So he talks about that, you know, the law with everything that we saw in it that you can read about in it is a shadow of what was to come, the substance being of Christ. And how far greater than, of course, Christ in his system is compared to the law of Moses. So he tells them, you know, that's just a shadow. You need to be focused on the substance that is in Christ. In verse 18, he tells them, don't be cheated. Let no one cheat you of your reward. Um, when he says humility, again, John's translation said asceticism. What's that idea of asceticism? Does anybody know? It is the idea that you um, purify yourself by denying yourself certain physical uh, things. <laughs> and you, you use that as a form of, of self-discipline. Right. It's, we might describe it as extreme self-denial. Um, Stoics were sort of like this in that they thought rid themselves of all worldly pleasure, you know, comfort, things like that. Um, so he's saying you've got this mindset that's out there, and this would be from the world, uh, the humility, or he says in the New King James, this false humility. They're, they're self-deceived in the humility that they would have. Or the worship of angels, uh, the worship of those angelic beings. Uh, these asceticists that came in among them had this idea that they had a special connection with the spirit world. And so they had this worship of angels. They, it says they're intruding into those things which he has not seen. How do you understand that? That he's intruding into things which he has not seen. Any thoughts? You ever run into somebody who claims they've seen something and you know for a fact they've never seen that? What verse was that? Religiously, in verse 17. What is your translation? Or verse 18, sorry. Verse 18. What does your translation have? Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions. Okay, exactly. That, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about this person says they have these visions. And the idea is they're intruding or they're going into those areas in their discussion, in their claims that they've not seen. They're saying they've seen it. But they have it. They're deluded into what they're saying. Um, so it says that he's vainly puffed up in his mind, in his fleshly mind or sensual mind, I think uh, John's translation had. Um, have you ever talked to someone who claimed God has spoken to them? And they're not just saying I think God wants me to do this. They're saying God has literally spoken to them. Okay? You know automatically the person is self-deceived. Okay? We all have that little voice in our head, so to speak. We, we have this reasoning, this debating within our mind. We talk to ourselves in our minds. Some people... My interpretation of what they claim is some people take that as God speaking to them. Well, they're their own God. 
And you can see that in the world because people follow all these different paths saying God's leading them. Well, how is God leading these people in all these different directions? It's because God is really not talking to them. It's only them. Only their thoughts, their reasonings that they're following after. And that's what's happening here. He's saying, don't buy into this. They say they have this special connection. They say they worship these angels. They say they've seen these visions. It's not true. Don't go with it. Any thoughts there? Chris? Uh, in my experience, the one thing that I see is when someone like that tells you they're being led to do something in a certain way, we all know that God would never lead someone against His own word. So that's the first thing that should pop out in your mind. He's wanting you to do what? Have you not read the Scriptures on what you should be doing? in the first place. Right. When um, John saw the vision in Revelation and the angel spoke to him, he immediately fell down to worship and the angel said, do, don't do that. You only worship God. So if these people had had, had, had encounters with God's angels, mm -hmm. they would have been told the same thing. That's not the, John was not the first person to be told, don't worship me. Exactly. Exactly so right. The knowledge of even the old law would have told them that. They it should have been very clear on yeah. that, right? But but these guys are coming in with a false religion and false practices and trying to claim a spiritual superiority, and that's what a lot of people are doing today. That charismatic thought, that concept is invading the what we would call mainline denominations. More and more Baptist people get this idea that God is leading them in some way separate and apart from the Word of God. And it's just their feelings. It's just what results they may get that tells them, oh, we need to be doing this. So if they have this youth program and they have these different little bells and whistles that they offer to people and a lot of people show up, oh, look at what God's doing with us here. You know, so they don't go to the Scripture. They, they go to their own feeling, thoughts, experiences, John and then Mike. All this is based on what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to worship anything but God, whether it's an angel, which is a heavenly being, that's, that's from Satan. It's our own will, uh, that's, that's from Satan. Uh, it's anything other than what God gives us in the New Testament, that's of Satan. All these other things, even though we might hold them as holy, if it's not worshiping God, then it's of Satan. And if, when in Christ was tempted, He said that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only Him thou shalt serve. Well, that's the same message for us. It's only only God is the only one that we can worship, and anything else, as holy as it is, is of Satan. Right, exactly, Mike. Well, what you're talking about is the big shift. It's a paradigm shift that's starting to happen in the religious world today. And it's gone beyond just what the Pope has a vision and he tells everybody it has gone to individuals now. And so now it is it is becoming more and more hard to get people to sit down and show them a scripture that what it clearly says and then still agree with that because it's not how they feel and whatever sign or whatever it was that God gave them is saying something completely different. So we as Christians have to learn how to you know, go around that now, you know, and mm -hmm. learn how to teach around that kind of thinking. And, um, you know, so it's become a little bit different of a world than what we had even, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Right, right. Yeah, it comes down to that basic concept of we, we have to establish what is the authority in religion. Right. And if, unless they grasp that the Word is the authority, the sole authority in religion, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. It's just not going to happen. Uh, sort of like if somebody just doesn't believe in God, you can argue all day long about the church or about baptism. It's, it just doesn't matter. If they don't believe in God. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're getting more and more to the basics uh, of trying to establish with people where we once shared some fundamentals in common. We just had differences of understanding and application. But be that as it may, 
He goes on to talk about, um, we just have to move on a little quicker here, uh, not holding fast the head. So when they follow these false things in 18, that means they're not holding fast to Christ, the one who is the head of the body. They are not being nourished and knit together. And that's where we need to be, is attached to Christ, holding fast to Him, where we will be nourished by Him and growing in the Lord. So then in verse 20, he says, Therefore, if you die with Christ, or the, really the concept is since you die with Christ, from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Does somebody want to reword that for us? What's he, what's he driving at here? You die with Christ from the basic principles of the world, what would that be? Well, it's a condition that we have died with Christ, therefore we've been buried in waters of baptism, and we've given up this old life, and He's now wanting us to look to Christ as our head and our authority, because if we return back to those things, as also we understand, we have fallen from grace, because we're no longer justified. Right, yeah, Galatians chapter 5 spells that out very clearly, Mike. Well, and also in the old law, in order to be you know, pure, you have a purification process, you have, don't eat this, don't do that, this is clean, this is unclean, and he's saying those are very basic things that we can see in the world. However, you have to overcome that. Um, it's not about going back to those, those things anymore. It's about understanding what your sin is and um, refraining from your sin rather than using this sacrifice as a mediation for your sin. You came out of it. Why are you going back to it? It's the same thing, essentially, yes, the Galatians. What, why, why would you go back to what you came out of? You know, it's, it's coming in in a little bit different form. For those who had a, a Gentile background, you know, they came out of paganism and they had all these rules and regulations and stuff. And he's saying, look, it's the same thing, just in a different package here. Don't be deceived in this. Don't, don't give in to that. So, he's saying get away from these things. Don't observe them. So, they may appear impressive, but have no real value. That's what he's talking about. You know, when he says, here's these regulations, and he quotes them in verse 21, you know, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. So, this asceticism, this lifestyle that's being pushed upon them and, and saying, well, you know, if you don't touch certain things, um, you know, you don't touch a pig, for instance you're going to be pure. But if you touch it, you're going to be impure. Don't taste. So there's certain foods you can't eat, certain meats you can't eat, or certain things you, you, just, you just can't have. Uh, don't handle. So he's saying all these things, all these lists and rules. Now, let's understand as we go through this, he's not talking about things that are sinful inherently. He's not talking about alcohol, getting drunk, doing drugs. That's not what... He's talking about these normal, everyday, common things. They come along, they try to regulate your diet, try to regulate where you can go, what you can um, handle, what you can have in your home, different things like that. They all concern things which perish with the using. They're all just coming to nothing. In and of themselves, they're not morally right or morally wrong. They're just things. You know, eating fish or not eating fish or eating pork or not eating pork or whatever element they may have there and it's according, verse 22, to the doctrines and commandments of men. It's just what men have made up that you're to live by to try to make you feel like you're holy. Again, you think about all the things out there in the, the pagan world, whether it's Hindus or it's Buddhists or any other type of religion of men, they have all these regulations that come with it as to how you can be pure and holy and all these festivals and all these rituals. And he's saying it's all for nothing. It's empty. But serving Christ is where it's at. Now question, go ahead, Andrew. With this part here and winding back up here with the worship of angels and it feels like we're starting to see a first paradigm shift 
here in the first century toward Catholicism. We're going to get to that in just a second. Okay. Yeah, 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 very good, very good. We're, we're, our minds are headed in the same direction here, exactly right. So um, well, let's just hit that and we'll wrap this up. What religions are similar to the things he mentioned? Go ahead, Andrew. Catholicism is the first one that's coming to mind. Well, what did Catholicism do? How did it, how did it grow? What, what's, what I would say is its main strength and staying power. You mean like how's it been around for the last 2,000 years? Yeah. Since, you know, third century, the very germination, maybe even going back to this time, but... They had that pyramid deal with everybody taking authority from another person. Okay. Like other churches, which all seemed to bow the road by the time of the 56th century. There, there's a part of that. Anybody else know? Anybody out of Catholicism? Caesar? Okay. The, the main staying power of Catholicism is absorbing the cultures they go into, changing the name. Okay, well, don't worship the sun god. Keep the symbol. Keep the festival. Keep all your practices, but we'll just call it Jesus Christ. I mean, that's how you get Christmas tree, Christ mass. They, they just absorbed the pagan culture in Europe and just brought that in. They, that's all they've done. They just absorbed these things. They said, well, let's change the name and the, the, the reason for it, but keep all those practices, keep all the regulations, keep all those things, and we're good to go. Just say you're a Catholic and give money. Stephen, wasn't that also what they did when they established all the various saints, that those saints represented various pagans from those nations that through the conquest and... Exactly. Hey, you guys, you guys like drinking? We'll have a saint of wine, a saint of brewers. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. You, you want to be selfish? You want to be materialistic? You want to go to war? Well, we, we've got a saint for that. Go ahead. Joe, yeah. When we did that in Brazil, uh, when I was down there, uh, God the Father to the black slaves with an old black man with a, you know, with a pipe. And uh, they just changed the names and different things. But there's a lot of that in Mormonism, too, the worship of angels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, you guys are saying this is all new, but Mormonism started, what, about 400 years ago? Yeah. Back then they were believing that a guy was, was being told prophetic things with a book of gold somewhere, you know, the, the, the things they had to keep. Peeping stone? Yeah, I got this far <laughs> back then. And yeah, I agree. Stone. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of this still today. Um, and, and yes, you can trace back. I'm, I'm looking at the United States of America. There have been some of those fringe elements but most of our religious neighbors up until the past 20, 30, 40 years, they, they would say, well, we need to look at the Bible. Okay, they, they would generally agree with that. Now they're, they're, they've detached from the Bible over years and years and years of being taught that essentially it's, a, it's only about a personal relationship with Jesus and you know, your communication with Him. And the Bible essentially is secondary to a lot of people. So, Mike. Well, all of these different religions around, we have to be careful of this also. Yep. In, in verse uh, 23, he says that they have the appearance of wisdom. And so they have a very appealing um, calling to a lot of, of, of as you pointed out, a, a various diverse background of people. And um, so we have to be careful of that also, that we're not kind of sucked into some of that. And the only way to do that is exactly what we're doing now, and is studying the scriptures. What does the scripture say about these things? And uh, you know, really kind of being grounded in what it teaches. Right. All that other stuff will kind of bounce off of. Yeah. the The real danger that I see is these things are very exciting and on fire right now, and the crowds in those churches are growing and things like that. And that's very deceiving and thinking, oh, it must be a good thing. We have, I mean, you think about living in um, 
the first century with paganism and how exciting some of those things would have been, don't get caught up in that. Go to the Word. Make sure you stay rooted and grounded. Well, I think also a lesson of what Paul does there in Athens, and that is he realizes that people are searching for something. Mm -hmm. And so where can I start and where can I grow their knowledge of who God actually is? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we see a lot of times we just go, it's all doom and gloom for us. However, there is a huge opportunity, and the reason a lot of masses of people are going to something is because they are searching for something and just don't know what they're searching for yet. Right, exactly. Chris? Yeah, a lot of what I see, especially in, in the new uh, religions that have popped up within the last few years, uh, if you see these people on TV, sometimes you know, they'll advertise those sort of commercials. People on TV. Like a big rock show. Yeah. Everybody's coming into a rock show with bands and power yeah. antics and yeah. And but they're no different than the Catholics were whenever they first started doing what we're talking about because they're doing all they're doing is pleasing, absorbing culture. They're, they're giving man what he wants to hear, what he wants to see versus what he needs to hear. They're being yeah. pleasers of man instead of pleasers of God. Right. Okay. So so I'm gonna. Put, put a little point down right here. Churches of Christ are susceptible to falling into that. I've seen it happen. They get caught up. They see what a denomination is doing and they want to take that and um, Church of Christ it. Right? Okay, we'll, we'll filter out the instrumental music. We'll filter out the female teachers, although some now are really pushing for the idea of female leaders in a congregation in many different ways. But we'll filter some of those things out, but man, we're going to have the feeling and the love and the warmth and the ooey gooeyness, and we're going to um, get excited, and the, the song leader's going to run back and forth and jump up and down and do all that stuff to get everybody really excited. And so they're, they're absorbing those things. They're trying to, trying to hold that line, but the problem with that is that next generation is not going to respect those things. And they're going to keep going and go further. Be that as it may. Any other thoughts before we move on? All right. Paul. That uh, verse 23. Yes, sir. They have an appearance of wisdom. That, 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 we're our word. We're, we're our worst enemy when it comes to God's Word. We just have to walk in the Spirit, He tells us, you know. I mean, if we're not, if we're not of the mind, right mindset, we're going to go off in an entirely different direction with these verses. That right. God is great with His wisdom, and He only gives it to those who walk in the Spirit. I mean, you can see all kinds of stuff in here, but unless you're walking in the Spirit, you can't. And walking in the Spirit is walking according to the Word of God that was revealed by the Spirit. And just going to briefly touch on this, and we're going to jump into chapter 3. But the last thing that he says there, you know, it's, it's got this false humility. It's a self-imposed religion. It's what you created, what man has created. You have this false humility and neglect of the body, so you're, you're practicing this asceticism and, and self-discipline, all that. But they have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And what he's talking about there is you can practice all these things you want, but it's no good in regard to sin. It's not going to help you be pure. It just doesn't work that way. The only way you can be pure from sin is by the blood of Jesus Christ and following His will. That's it. All right, chapter 3. Let's read verses 1 through 11 here, please. Who will grab that for us? Colossians 3, 1 through 11. Go ahead. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For if you have, if you have died and your life is hidden, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also be revealed with Him in glory. 
Therefore, consider it members, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman. But Christ is all and in all. Okay. So, first of all, he talks about we have to have our mind set in the right place, set on things above. And he makes this argument based on the fact you've been raised with Christ. They had been. So, it's not like if, but since, again since you've been raised in Christ, you need to seek the things that are above. So question one I ask, what are some things above for which we are to seek? Just name a couple. Um, holiness first and purity, which it kind of goes hand in hand with that, joy and unity, because all of those are in heaven. They were before Christ came, and they're there now, and they will be. Right, exactly. You have the example of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and their oneness, their unity together, the holiness of the Godhead. Very good. Any other thoughts? Wisdom and knowledge to be able to continue to understand and grow. Exactly. That keeps us grounded and walking in the Spirit, as Paul was talking about. Um, seeking that inheritance. That crown of life that is there, going after that and making that our passion and pursuit in life. So focus on the heavenly things and not the earthly things because we have died and your life is hidden with God. What's he talking about that we have died? Did somebody put a fine point on that for us? You've been buried in the watery grave laying down the old man and arising the new, leaving your sins that you were once a part of behind in the following life. Exactly. We've died to our sins. So question two is, instead of changing our eating habits or returning to the old law for purity, what are we to do and why? In verses 5 down through 9. What does he tell us specifically to do? <laughs> he tells us that we are to put to death the members of the flesh and that in so doing this you know, we put off the things that are of the earth as we have just been talking about those desires that people are looking to as a form of um, purity or religion and we put on Christ yes exactly right any other thoughts there to whom is he writing? <clears throat> Christians. What's he telling Christians to do? Verse 5? Quit sinning. Quit sinning. Some of them were caught up in these things. That's why he has to address it. Hey, you can't do this. Okay? These guys are coming in telling you to keep the new moons, the Sabbaths, all that. There's another group of guys coming in and telling you you have to have a certain dietary restriction and all those things, practices asceticism. And he just ended that last chapter with, it's no good against the indulgence of the flesh. Guess what? <laughs> You're caught up in this sin. You've got to quit. You died with Christ. You need to put your mind there in heaven and not on these things on this earth. And having that as a part of your, your life and your attitude. So we might sum it up as immorality. So it's fornication. You know, unlawful sexual intercourse. Uncleanness. What is uncleanness? 
It's the New King James I'm following, of mm -hmm. course. Not clean. Good. Not clean. Well, that, that is true. He has a context here. But it has to do with impurity in your life. The contaminations of these religions you're bringing into your life. What, what was a lot of paganism based on in the first century? The practice of it, the, the worship, the festivals. They wanted to work in desires of the flesh, harlotry, and other sexual sins that they uh, they would do for these for these gods. But it's a sexual impurity that uh, God did despise. Them. Look, look at the context: fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. Okay, a lot of times we associate covetousness with wanting things. What did the Ten Commandments say about your neighbor's wife? Don't covet your neighbor's wife. He's talking about a group of sexual sins here. So fornication we get. Uncleanness is that which is short of fornication. So it might be pornography, lusting after your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband. It's the things that lead up to it. Those impure thoughts. And then he talks about passion, the depraved passion, the evil desires, uh, wanting that which is forbidden. And then, of course, the covetousness. And all of this had to do with idolatry, but he's saying when you have this, particularly covetousness, he makes the point of, that's idolatry. It's nothing short of idolatry. Because you're worshiping the thing, the object, or you're worshiping the desire, which, by the way, idolatry is nothing other than men taking their desires and giving themselves a justification for fulfilling them and giving it a concrete image or idea. Well, this is the God of war. This is the God of, you know, fertility. Oh, well, I, you know, I want to worship the God of fertility because you can go and have sex all the time. That's, that's what they did. You want to get drunk? Well, there's a God for that. As we were talking about with the Catholics, with the saints. They just switched out the names. But that's what this is. So, he's talking about you're caught up in these. Some of you are doing these. You need to put them to death. You need to get rid of them out of your life. Why? Verse 6. That is the reason that God's wrath even exists because of those things, because of our sin, is why God has to punish or anything. He can't be around that. And so those are the things that separate us from God. It's not that you eat the fish or have eaten the fish. It's none of that has anything to do with it. It's these selfish things that we that we do. And, you know, those things have to be put out of our lives. Mm -hmm. Those kind of issues are stumbling blocks, which you put in front of you every time those people or whoever would do these things. And what that does is that causes you to be further and further from God. It continuously separates you from Him instead of putting it behind you and growing closer like you should. There's always a separation right there. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, whenever you look at even the Jewish uh, law and some of the things that you know, we see people try to do today in order to um, be pleasing to God, they give us a false sense of security. And they let us think that we can continue in our sins and all we have to do is do this thing and then God forgives us for that. And this isn't the only time Paul talks about this because he talks about it in Romans 6 also. You can't continue your sin thinking that God's grace is going to continue. That's not how that works. And you can't continue your sin thinking that you can just go and make this sacrifice or this new moon or this Sabbath or whatever it is and think that that's okay. It's mm -hmm. not. Right. And we get in a false sense of security also in thinking that if we kind of come here and just kind of show up, we take the Lord's Supper, we don't have the, um, the chemical 
punishments and we don't do this, that we're okay and we can continue in our sins. Mm -hmm. He says that is not what it's about at all. You have to put those sins away. Right. Some have the concept of, I've been baptized, I'm good. Correct. <laughs> And that's that's pretty much all they need to do, and that that is a false concept. Is as he's laying out here is you have to live a life of purity and righteousness before God, um, otherwise it's no good. Because for those who are practicing these things, he says God's wrath is coming upon you, coming upon the sons of disobedience. He gave his son as a sacrifice for you. You at one time accepted that sacrifice. And now some of you have fallen back into it. Now he comes back and makes this statement in verse 7 in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. He was saying one time this was a way of life for you. You lived in them. You were these things. It's sort of like when Paul writes to the Corinthians and he talks about you know being uh, filled with hate and being homosexuals and being adulterers and being thieves. And he says... You were those things. And now you're something different. As a child of God, you are to be different. And so here he's saying essentially the same thing. You've got to stay away from that. You can't practice those things. You lived in them at one time. That was your lifestyle. That you had no problem with them. There was no guilt. There was, you know, it was approved. You can't do that anymore. All right, any other thoughts there? See, in Romans 1 and 18, um, as we understand there, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. And as we know in the context there, you know, the, the perversions that were going on, the homosexuality, all the things that were um, part of their life there in Rome, that he is telling them that God's wrath will come upon you. Mm -hmm. And as we see now, we have a federal government or a, a high level of government that is promoting all forms of sexual perversion as it seems to be their principal agenda. And right. where will that lead? Right. It, it leads to one place. <laughs> Utter destruction. It, it will come. It will come. We stay on this path that absolutely will come. Uh, in many ways, just a side note, we are following the same path as ancient Rome and um, I'm totally convinced we're going to end up in the same place as ancient Rome. But we'll have another discussion another day on those things. So, Christians, verses 8 and 9. Now you yourselves to put off all these. What are all these? How could you sum them up? Of the works of the flesh. Okay. They're definitely works of the flesh. Paul mentions many of those over in Galatians chapter 5. What, what is anger and wrath and malice? Hatred is so there's, there's hatred, yes. The, these are attitudes and emotions that people have. You know, the, that other list of things... They're, they're desires, if you will, and they are practices. And here he's talking about there, there's another set of things here that are just as bad. The anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So these attitudes that lead to these words that are being spoken. John, wrong. I think as you just mentioned, and see, looking back, he, he refers to those things being self-imposed. And here we see self-willed. Yes, yes, exactly right. This is just letting themselves go. They're without restraint of the gospel. We need to be disciplined by the gospel, not the doctrines and commandments of men, so that we steer clear of these things. So very briefly, the uh, question number three to round out this section, how do we put on the new man? How do we do that? Don't lie to one another. You put off the old man with his deeds. Put on the new man. And how does he say we do that? And you know, the scripture repeats this again and again and again. We've talked about it here. Be renewed in knowledge. Be renewed in mind. You renew your mind, training it through the scripture to have a different outlook, a different attitude. 
You have that different understanding that leads to different habits, different practices in your life. It's all about the mind. Your battle is in your mind. <coughs> out here, if you've got your mind right, out here, you can handle it. But you have to get your mind right with the anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, all the other things that he has mentioned here. Be renewed in your knowledge. All right, uh, we'll wrap up there, Lord willing. We'll finish out Colossians 3 and go on in and finish Colossians 4. It's a rather short chapter next week.